Well, let's see. Good evening, everybody. Here we are at New Life Christian Assembly on Wednesday night in the Word. Uh, it's uh, 7 o'clock right now. And um, oh, I see several people have signed in already. Hello, everyone. Good to see you over there in the comment section. Um, so we're going to be studying the Word of God tonight, as we typically do on a Wednesday. Uh, I did want to... Uh, mention a few things uh, before we even pray. Give give a few minutes for people to to, to get here. Uh, but this is a Spirit Week at the church for our children, and uh, every every day there's a theme for our kids. Uh, Monday was Memory Monday. They had a memory verse to to share or to learn. Uh, yesterday was uh, Twin Tuesday. So if there are multiple kids in the family, they all had to dress alike. Uh, that was quite interesting. And then uh, today was was Wacky Hair Wednesday. So everyone had wacky hair. And you know what? Even some adults got involved and had their hair and their beards all crazy. I did think about doing it myself, but I thought that might be a little too much for everybody. But um, Wacky Hair Wednesday. Uh, tomorrow is, uh, what is tomorrow? Tie-dye Thursday. So the, the kids have tie-dyed shirts and they're going to be wearing shirts. And then Friday is a new life Friday. So they'll be wearing their new life gear. Um, so if you want to check out our kids' uh, pictures, you can go to hashtag uh, new life Haverhill kids uh, on your Facebook uh, search engine. Uh, hashtag new life Haverhill kids. And you can see all the all the posts that the, the parents put up there. So I want to commend all the parents of the church for getting your kids involved in this. It's really a great way to keep them connected. And uh, without school, uh, this is really a, a great activity to give some unity and give something creative for them to do. So uh, parents, thank you for being involved with that. Um, also, um, thank you, Paul and Dulce Cortez, for your leadership with our kids. Um, you're doing a great job. I heard that Paul had uh, pulled his back and wasn't able to get involved so much uh, yesterday or today. So uh, we want to pray for our brother Paul uh, tonight as well. Uh, also, I wanted to share with you um, that uh, our sister Gloria Chris uh, is doing well. Uh, her husband, Stan, did go home to be with the Lord about a week and a half ago now. Uh, Gloria is fine. She was, um, at, at first she was um, tested positive for the coronavirus, but she's been cleared of that. She's uh, resting and doing well at home. She has a great faith, an unshakable faith, and she's very happy that her husband is with Jesus right now. Uh, so our prayers are for Gloria and for the rest of the family. Um, I think most every one of you have heard that our dear sister Edie Glover uh, lost her husband last Friday, not because of the disease, but he had he was having surgery, and on the on the operating table something happened, and he didn't make it through the surgery. It was for his stomach. And so that was a real shock to the family. So our condolences to Edie and Misty and Tiffany and all the all the kids and grandkids. Uh, we're praying for you all to, just to feel God's peace at this time. Uh, then um, we also heard from Sandy Bistany today that her aunt had passed away. Uh, she had a stroke. And so, um, you know, so the family grieving over that loss. And so, you know, in the midst of all this, coronavirus, there, other things are happening, normal things are happening, things that happen anyway are happening. Uh, it's very difficult when there is a death because um, funerals cannot be arranged properly, um, church services and so forth. Uh, but we do want to pray for those three in particular, and uh, we want to pray for our brother Paul for his back. So let's go to the Lord right now and let's open up in prayer tonight, okay? Dear Father, Lord, we love you and we thank you for this time that we could share together on this live stream. We pray your blessing upon it. We, Lord, that um, everything that we do would bring you glory and honor and praise. Uh, we ask you, Lord, that your Holy Spirit would come to teach us what we need to know. And we pray, Lord, that um, those that have been affected by the coronavirus will be comforted, will be healed and comforted by your Holy Spirit. We pray for anyone that lost loved ones uh, to sense your peace and uh, your presence as they grieve. We pray, Lord, for Gloria Chris tonight. Lord, just your blessing to continue to be upon her, upon her uh, many, uh, many family members that are affected by this and friends. We just pray for your peace 
Lord, to flood their soul and uh, keep them strong. Thank you for glorious faith, Lord. And um, as she makes decisions, Lord, just be with her now. As she's got to make some uh, some difficult decisions coming up. Lord, we also want to pray for our sister Edie Glover and her family uh, and the loss of Edie's husband, Wayne Glover. We pray, Lord, just for your your peace, uh, your presence to flood Edie's soul. She seems, she seems very good uh, in speaking with her, but uh, certainly, Lord, it, it's a time to grieve. We pray your blessing over Edie, over the children, over the grandchildren, uh, many grandchildren, and the ones that attend our church, Lord, uh, in particular. Just bless them and take care of them in a special way. Lord, we pray for Sandy Bistany and, and the passing of her aunt uh, this week. We pray, Lord, for your blessing over the family as they grieve and mourn. And uh, Lord, just be with them all at this at this uh, at this time. And Lord, for all these families uh, that are that cannot have a regular funeral or or a, a viewing or anything like that, we just pray that you would give them the patience and the peace that they need. And Lord, when the time is appropriate, I'm sure we'll do something special uh, as we're able to do that. So Lord, bless our time tonight. Uh, oh, we also want to pray for our brother Paul Cortez for healing of his back in the name of Jesus. Uh, strengthen him, Lord, tonight. Let him know that you're with him. And Lord, may your blessing be upon our time in your word this evening. We give you thanks and give you opportunity to speak to our hearts tonight. In Jesus' name, we pray. Hallelujah. Amen. And amen. Oh, there you go. Okay. Uh, okay. I greet you in the name of the Lord. Um, my brother, Joe Franchella from Florida. Marcy Joe, uh, good seeing you here. Joe and I are we're baseball buddies in the day, right, Joe? We both love baseball together. Now we, we both love Jesus, which is amazing. Well, I wanted to I wanted to begin this tonight. Uh, we're, we'll be in Romans chapter in a little bit, but I just want to give a little a little bit of a teaching uh, regarding uh, what's going on in our country and across the world. There's just so much negativity and then criticism and debate about uh, how we're handling this coronavirus as a nation, as a people. Uh, every news show has an opinion, a very strong opinion, a lot of negative opinions. Um, you ever notice that the talk shows on, on radio, the talk shows are, are basically conservative and uh, the TV shows are mostly liberal. Um, but uh, yeah, there's a lot of debate and a lot of unsettled, unsettled uh, feeling uh, going on. Oh, I see our brother Rob Simpson. Rob, we've been praying for you too. Uh, God, God, Rob, uh, hang here. I know you, you're dealing with the coronavirus, but uh, we're trusting the Lord for total healing for you. Oh, my dear sister Linda Ruzzi down in New York. God bless you, Linda. Good to see you. Okay. I, hello, everybody. I, I would be here all night saying hello. So, I, hello. And I, I, if you have any comments, you know, or questions, feel free to write them. Um, we'll get back to you as soon as we can. But anyway, uh, I, I want to. I just want to respond to. I want to respond to the response of our of our of our media, of our national leaders and different people, different organizations. Man, I just want to. As a Christian person, as a as a Christian people, we need to view this whole situation as, you know, something that God is allowing. I mean, people are arguing: Is God doing this uh, or? Is this from Satan or God would never do this, you know, and there's just so many different opinions, but we're never going to know for sure. I mean, the, as a Christian, I think we can look at the scriptures and see how God uses illness and sickness and even disasters to accomplish a greater good. I could see that all through the Bible, but regardless of how you might feel about that, in any case, we need to be positive. We need to be trusting God that through all of this, He's working out something. We don't know exactly what it is. Romans 8, 28 says all things work together for good for those that love God and are called according to his purpose. If you're a church in person, we, we've got to believe something good is going to come out of this. And, and uh, so so however you might feel, uh, let, let's just get to the point where God is allowed. It, it can't be denied. And and what do we do with that? Okay, so what do we do with that? I mean. I want to I want to turn to a couple of scriptures, uh, if you can take your Bible or your Bible app, and uh, turn with me to First Timothy, 
chapter 2, uh, 1 Timothy chapter 2, and verses 1, 2, and 3. And this, this is my response to the response of everybody. Paul writes to Timothy, I exhort first of all that supplications and prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks for all men, for kings, and for all who are in authority, that may lead a quiet and peaceable life of all godliness and reverence. I mean, we need to be praying for our president. You may not like him. You may like him. It doesn't matter. Whoever our president is, we need to be for him. His cabinet people, our governors, our, our mayors, where we live. Um, there's just a lot of, you know, criticism. And our role is to be praying. I want to encourage everyone to minute every day or more and pray for national leaders. Pray for our medical experts. I mean, I think they're trying their best to figure this out. I mean, some of the questions I hear are like, well, how could anybody know the answer to these questions? We're all taken by surprise, you know. But anyway, pray for our leaders. Pray for our medical experts uh, that they would have wisdom and guidance to know how to handle this the best way. I want to pray for another thing. Corinthians uh, chapter... Uh, Second Corinthians chapter, and I see a, a scripture here that reminds us uh, that Paul and company uh, at the time went through a terrible time in, in various times of their ministry. Uh, this says so. Second Corinthians one, one uh, verses uh, eight through eleven. Paul writes to the church of. I don't want you to be ignorant, brethren, of trouble which came to us when we were in Asia. We were burdened in measure above strength so that we despaired even for our life. What that means is the they were so burdened. They were so, you know, troubled and, and they didn't even want to live anymore. That sounds like a really good clue. I'm just saying there, there are times when. When we get to a place where we say, Lord, I don't know if I could make it anymore. And it's okay to see that. I see it all through the Bible. And Paul's saying, he's saying to the church in Corinth, listen, brother, I want you to be unaware or ignorant of what we were dealing with. We wanted to die. We didn't live anymore. And verse number nine says, yes, we had the sentence of death in ourselves. That's pretty intense. Um, that we should not trust in ourselves. And God who raises the dead. So he's saying, we, we didn't even want to live. We had a sentence of death. But what he's saying is God let us feel that so that we could no longer trust in ourselves, but trust in him who raises the dead. So even if we die, you know, which eventually he did die a martyr's death, but even if we die to raise the dead, you know, so we have eternal life. And so, yeah, so then verse 10. It says, uh, he delivered us from so great a death and does deliver us in whom we trust that he will still deliver us. I, I like that. Okay, Second Corinthians 1.10, he delivered us, he does deliver us, and he still will deliver us. It's like salvation. You know, he saved us. We're being saved, then we will be saved. It's the same principle. But here he's talking about in the actual physical realm. He delivered, the Lord delivered them. He is delivering them now. He delivered them in the future. And the Lord did deliver Paul many times, but he, he also suffered abuse. He was whipped. He was beaten. He was thrown in jail. He was hungry. He was up uh, uh, sleepless at night many times. Uh, uh, persecuted. Finally, he was killed, and the Lord just took him home. So, and then in, uh, the last verse, so 2 Corinthians 1.11, uh, you also helping us together in prayer. So he's saying, yeah, God will help us. God helped us. He does and he will help us. But you're helping us by praying for us. That's where that's going with this. Uh, need to be praying for people that are going through difficult times and uh, making very, very, very uh, important decisions on a national uh, as far as how we as a nation uh, deal with this coronavirus. So, 
So I'm going to share those scriptures with you. Someone had mentioned Second Chronicles 7, uh, you know, if my people who are called by my name will humble up and pray and seek my face and turn from their, you know, hear from heaven and uh, I will heal their land. And yeah, that's that was my contention a few weeks ago that um, we believe that verse that people should pray, you know, God's people should pray, turn from their wicked repent, get right, pray, and God will bring healing to man, and he will also forgive their sin. We we all accept that. The verse for that, though, tells us that the calamities that he wants to, that he will heal the land from are calamities that he imposes upon the land, which is a, a, an interesting aspect, that God wants things to happen to make his people get point to pray, etc., and then heal them land of the of the calamities that he put on. So yeah, I think that the Lord is selling this. I'm not saying this is a judgment to go that far. I, I don't think God's trying to punish anybody. I really think he's simply at our attention. I mean if you go back in history, uh whatever you know whatever war you could remember, what Desert Storm or you know whatever, Vietnam or Korea or whatever whatever conflict. If you could re- been 11 you know 2001 was god trying to punish people in 9 11 well god allowed that to happen and i'll never never 9 11 because in the months after that uh every church that i knew about i was uh i was an assistant pastor at that time no no no, no. in uh, webster mass but every church that i knew at that time uh, an area of massachusetts was was full of people people were coming running the church and 11 and that lasted for about a year and then it started to fade off and people got back to their role again but god does use things he does use things to get it get our attention especially the people of god's attention okay so we go to romans chapter five now i'm sorry <laughs> chapter six uh although we'll be talking a little bit about chapter five romans five and six kind of go hand in hand uh remember uh, theme of the book of Romans. Um, let's see. The theme is found in Romans 1, uh, verses 16 and 17. Um, when Paul writes, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, uh, for it is the power of God unto salvation uh, to the Jew first, also to the Gentile. For in it, in this gospel, uh, the righteousness of God is revealed and uh, the just shall live by faith. So in, in this God, that's the theme of the whole book of Romans. So when we get into chapter 5 and 6, they kind of go, which, uh, which really uh, embellishes the concept found in Romans 1, uh, 16 and 17, that righteousness is found in the gospel. Righteousness is found outside of the gospel. Uh, righteousness is found through Jesus Christ. Unrighteousness is found as we follow our fallen nature, our our Adam nature, our Adamic nature. Uh, through that nature came sin and the and death, and through the nature of Christ came grace and life and righteousness and eternal. And so there's this, you know, this analogy of living for God or living for the flesh uh, throughout the book. of of Romans, but the the righteousness is revealed through the gospel. Uh, to reiterate that um, we could never find the righteousness of God by being good enough in and of ourselves, or being rich enough, making enough, making enough, uh, much money, or being smart enough, getting so many degrees and plaques on the wall, or whatever, so popular enough, or whatever we say. Nothing could make us right with God other than putting our faith in Jesus Christ, who paid for our salvation on the cross. So chapter 6 begins, um, we looked at this last week in verse number 1. What shall we say then? Because Paul in chapter 5, it's all by grace, not by works, it's not by the law, it's by grace, by what Jesus did for you, it's by believing in that and that. So naturally, he would say, we should go ahead and 
sin and you know this will abound more the more we sin the more grace there is uh, and paul says in verse 2 certainly not now we're, we're going to start in verse number 15 but if you look at romans 6 15 he says the same thing as he said in verse number one strong point he's trying to make we probably make a case that um you know paul speaking to the church of rome uh as we already established there's uh, Jewish people that accepted Christ there. There's Gentile people, non-Jewish people who accepted Christ there. There's probably some people that are still seeking to find out what they really believe. And so hitting everyone with this, you know, he's he's hitting everyone with this. He's making a really fine point. And, and in that sense, uh, there, there may have been some people that were saying, well, grace is abounding, so I could, you know, I could live ungodly i could live in flesh uh because christ for my sin and i do think there's a degree of that same philosophy today with some christian people or kind of a light-hearted approach to sin that well if i sin i could always confess they do you know if, if we sin we must confess but we can't take it frivolously and, and sin without feeling you know a, a consequence because of the sin uh, so anyway, so he says it a couple of times here. Um, what shall we, verse number, what shall we say then? Uh, because we're not under law, but under grace, you know, shall we sin? Uh, because we're not law, but under grace, he says, certainly not. Um, so let's see. Now in first uh, chapter six, in the preceding verses to that, I want, I want to just focus on this because last week we kind of went a little quickly chapter six and verse number 11 it says like you also this is where this is where it changes this is what it, where it hinges that uh, yes christ died for us but we cannot live a sinful life now just because he died he says likewise you also must reckon yourself you must think like like what, what is this what happened Jesus died and was buried and rose on the third day. And, and, and you, when you come to Christ, you crucify your flesh with Christ Christ's cross. You die to self. This is, uh, by the way, um, emphasized or, or depicted through water baptism, immersion under the water, going into, so to speak, and then out of the grave, rising up uh, as a new creation with resurrection. He's saying, likewise, think of yourselves that way. You can't live your own life, your own life that way. So he says in verse number 12, he says, therefore, you know, because of that, therefore, don't sin reign in your body. Uh, and don't, not that you would obey its lusts. So he's coming right out and saying, no, you can't sin more so that grace would abound. He's saying right here, flat out, don't let sin reign in your body. Verse 13, don't present your members as instruments of unrighteousness, you know. To, but rather present yourselves to God as being alive and dead and your members as, as instruments of righteousness to God because sin shall not have dominion. And we ended this life. So we're no longer in the domain of sin. We're in the domain of, of God's kingdom where there's grace and life and forgiveness and mercy and you know eternity awaiting us. So in light of that, he's saying, because don't go backwards the way you think in the way you used to live and the, do the things you used to do that were in the flesh now you're 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 delivered from that so don't go back there but live, live a victory in christ so yeah so this is really good this is, i just i referred to it a, a few weeks ago as the profound paradox this is a profound paradox we would never be good enough to save ourselves, right? That's why Jesus came. No man, woman, no human could pay for our salvation, which is, brings in the whole concept of virgin birth and Christmas, the Christmas, all, all that's involved with that. Jesus' is sin, uh, sinless life. Um, yeah, so Jesus came, purchased our salvation 
because we couldn't do it. But now that they've done that and we identify with him, this is the box. Now he expects us to live a life that's above reproach. This is the paradox. We couldn't do it. He did it. Uh, we couldn't do it. So he came and he did it for us. And he's saying, because I did it for you, I want you to live reproach. And eternity is promised to you. You've got a life to live on earth. We're still under the, the domain, if you will, of Satan. Right? Satan, to this earth, this life, now, we're in, the, we're in a different kingdom. Well, we're living here. That's why I, I referred to this last year. We are pilgrims. We're passing through. Uh, we're sojourners. Uh, our, our residence is really in heaven. If we go through the book of Hebrews, we see that quite a bit, that our real residence is not uh, Haverhill, Mass, or or, or Fort New York, or wherever, but our, our real residence is uh, is in heaven with the Lord. But in, in that, uh, we are instructed by God to to care of our spirit man right take care of our our being now this is really emphasized in chapter 7 i just want to turn here for a, a little bit are familiar with romans chapter 7 i'm going to start reading us uh, uh, verse 15 and, and but i want to I want to preface this by saying that this this message attracts Debate. It attracts debate because people say Paul is talking about how life was before Christian. Other people say that this passage is about Paul's struggle while he was a Christian. My take on the whole thing is I do think Paul was referring to how it was before he was a Christian. Uh, and we'll see that in a minute. I also think that would be naive to think that we don't, don't visit here every now and then when we fall all struggle so this is what he says and tell me if you haven't been here as a christian person so as a non-christian person you've been here but as a christian person tell me if you haven't been here as well so romans 7 here and verse 15 what i'm doing i do not understand i will to do that i do not practice but what I hate, that's what I do. If I was in church, I would say, could somebody just give me a little A? Because we know what we should do most of the time. And sometimes we choose, you know, to do the opposite. He goes, if then I do what I will not do, I agree with the law. The law is good because it's causing sin, okay? But now it is no longer I who do it, but it's the sin that dwells in me. For I know that in me, that is in my life, nothing good is still is present with me. Before what is good, I, I find. So it's like he feels, yeah, he wants to do good. He knows what he should do. It. The good uh, For the good that I will to do, I do not do. But the evil I will not to do, that's what I do. Tell me tell me but have you ever been there you know now if i do what i will do there's no longer i who do it but sin that dwells in me i then find the law that is present with me the one who wills to good the evil is present with me me the one who wills to do good the one who wants to do good has evil dwelling in him and the law of god, god the inward man but I see it in my members, warring against the law of my mind and bring into captivity to the law of sin in my members. Famous line, verse 20. Oh, wretched man, that I am! Exclamation point. Like, ah, I, I, can't, I can't deal with myself. Who will deliver me from this body of death? That's why I think before he, he was. But I guess. We would be naive to think that this is totally dedicated because we still have a life to live on earth. I'll get to that in more in a minute. He says, I, God, you know, who will deliver me? I, I, Jesus Christ, Lord. So then with the mind, I myself serve the law of God. 
God who has no sin. So who will deliver us? Jesus will deliver us. And going back to what we shared earlier, as a matter of fact, we could we could have another argument here that we've been delivered, we're being delivered, we shall be delivered. We've been saved, being saved, we will be saved. There's an on here. So I think what, what the best way to look at that is before we became a Christian, we didn't have a clue what to do with our we would do good, maybe, maybe we, we saw some things that were you know we want to fix. We we didn't have the power, the knowledge, the, the, the insights, we didn't have the spiritual power to do it. But through Christ, we came to Christ, he saved us, he forgave us of sin. But now we're in this walk with him. And now again, Paul's writing to the in Rome. So he's writing to he's writing to the people. He's writing to them saying, look, now that the big thing has happened, you've accepted Christ. Now God is expecting all of us godly life above reproach. And there will be times when you want to do what you, you know, you want to do what you, know you shouldn't do. And what you shouldn't do is what you end up doing. And but the answer is always the same. Deliver me from this body of death, oh wretched that I am. Thanks be to through Jesus Christ. Jesus is still the answer. He was the answer for me many years ago when I when my family told me to get right with Jesus. Yeah, I did. But he's still my day because it's still my. It's still. It's still, I'm still on earth. I'm still with myself in situations and coronavirus and everything going on and not in heaven yet, in case anyone didn't notice. We're not out there yet. But, but as a Christian person, now, now we have tools. We have the ability to live a godly life above reproach. But we can't be naive to think that the battle you know, is not there. The battle is definitely there. So. Now, with that in mind, <laughs> another thing here about the battle. Okay, turn with me. Take your Bible. Uh, First Peter chapter five. Uh, um, and this is what I mean by the still going on. Peter writes in First Peter five, uh, verse number in nine. He says uh, to the, he's writing to be sober. Be vigilant, because the adversary, the devil, walks around like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Test him, test the faith. No, no same sufferings are experienced by brotherhood in all the world. So Peter's flat out telling us we're in a spiritual battle, and there there is definitely a spiritual component to our here on earth. That's why Paul also writes in Ephesians. He says in chapter six, put on the arm, you know, get ready for for them. You know, fight the battle. So so he's interesting. He says two things about about this battle. One he says in in, in, in Ephesians 6, put on the armor of God that you may resist the devil, the the schemes, and you may stand, you you know, may forward and stand against the wiles or the schemes. Okay, now the first Corinthians chapter six. And I want to share something else about this war, this battle. Uh, 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 verse first Corinthians verse 18. Sometimes we're called to fight, you know, fight, put on the armor, the helmet, the breastplate, the sword, the, the shield, the, the sand, you know, the you know. Gird your waist with truth and all, all those things, you know, that, that we, we talked about. In, in 1 Corinthians 6, verse 18, it says to flee sexual immorality. Run away from it. <laughs> Don't even, I mean, it's a form of fighting if you, if you follow the drift. That's how you, there's some things that you fight by avoiding. You, you leave it. Like Joseph in the Old Testament when he was tempted by Potter's wife. He fled from that room, just left, left, you know, immediately. Uh, so sometimes you fight this fight 
by, by making decisions to leave certain temptations or things that may grip our heart or grip our flesh. But it's, like it's a spiritual thing manifest as the flesh. So that's one aspect of this, you know, it's a spiritual battle. It's manifested sometimes in the flesh through sexual sin or lust. That's that's. Um, but it could be other things too. It could be it could be pride. It could be arrogance. It could be self sufficiency. It doesn't. You know, it could be different things. But but all kind of weighing on our mind and spirit. And Paul is saying, and Peter are, are both saying the same. Thing. This is a spiritual battle you're dealing with. You know, Paul says in Ephesians six, we don't wrestle against blood. We're wrestling wrestling against spiritual forces uh, and principalities of this. I'll go somewhere else real quickly uh, before we get back into Romans. This is all, all battle. Uh, 2 Timothy chapter 4, uh, verses 14 and 15. Um, yeah, I, I, like, I love, love these comments. I, I, I've been over at them. I, I would comment on every one. Um, thank you for comments. They're really. I, I just want to bring up this one battle. So there's just we have to deal with. Um, you know, there's our sinful, fallen nature we have to deal with. You know, which uh, which has been shaped by our lives, our life experience, you know, our upbringing, our families, whatever. The things we've done, or our experiences, and our, our de- decisions, good and bad, but shape us and make us who we are. But I find another one in, in Timothy 4, in verses 14 and 15. Uh, Paul addresses Tim- Timothy's pastoring the church of Ephesus, that Paul loves Ephesus and spent a lot of time there. So he's in- invested a lot of himself in the church of Ephesus. Now he put Timothy in charge, and he's telling Timothy, you know, giving him some guidance. Uh, so that's a good to remember. An elder gives to a younger. But in, in verse 13, uh, Paul calls out somebody named Alexander, the coppersmith. He says, uh, now this is another form of a battle. Sad to say this, but even in the church, you know, in the churches, over the centuries, there's conflict within the churches. You know, you, you have this, this I, the Lord is coming back for a perfect church, spotless. And you get into the nitty gritty of what goes on in many, many local churches and uh, it'll break your heart. But he says here to Tim, Alexander the coppersmith did me much harm. He hurt me. May the Lord repay him for his works, which is a sign of maturity. Of Paul saying, I'm going to go get him because he hurt me. You know, I'll let the Lord deal with him, you know. But he says to Timothy, You must be aware of him, for he has greatly needed our words. So, so fortunately, there are people within churches that think they know everything, that think they know better than the leadership, that think whatever, whatever they want to think. And it's a different sort of a battle. It, it's the theme of a battle. It's a battle that shouldn't exist, but unfortunately, we saw through Scripture. Uh, I, I preached this uh, topic many times. I've taught on it. I think the point is, we ready for those kind of battles. And there's sometimes when uh, I'm speaking to New Life Christian Assembly, or who else is, who was listening, but when someone leaves a church, I say. Man, so oh, sorry, so and so is leaving the church. But other times, you may say to yourself, "Thank the Lord, for moving on," because this setting is not working out. They they need to uh, go <laughs> go somewhere where maybe someone else could minister to them and help them with the issues that they're you know that they're dealing with. Uh, I said it on Sunday when Paul and Dulce. Uh, Paul was preaching on Sunday, and I said that um, at the end of May they'll be they'll be moving um, probably back to either Connecticut or Pennsylvania with their parents being, but they're they're going to be candidating to find a church to pastor. 
But when they do leave, they'll be leaving the right way. It'll be a blessing to leave and send them off properly. And um, so anyway, going back to, to six, uh, we're in this battle, the spiritual battle. Uh, but look at chapter six, Romans six, 12 and 13. Don't let sin reign in your body, right? And don't, at verse 13, don't present your members as instruments of unrighteousness. So it's like, you know, let's say um, it's the, Satan comes like a lion, so he may devour. So we get tempted to do something, we're tempted to steal something, let's say. We're walking down the street, we see a nice bike, like a, you know, whatever, 10 speed, 20 speed bike. And, and man, you could, you could get away with it. And Satan's playing, man, no one's going to know. You need a bike, whatever. And you could, you could, so what do you, Paul, don't entertain those thoughts. Don't, don't let unrighteousness get a grip on. You know, run from that, flee from that, protect yourself from that, and, and move away from that. That's what he's saying. And it, it, it could be in any way. Flee sexual immorality. You know, you can't, you can't, uh, you can't toy with that. You can't get close to the fire and expect not to get burned. You will get burned, and it'll cause more destruction than it's worth. Uh, a, a person in the church that that confronts you it just hurts you and and talk bad about you and your family or whatever you may have to see to say hey man tell us out behind the behind the shed you know what i mean like in the old days i want to settle this man to man you know but see that's the fleshly nature and paul's saying you can't go there with that you've got to be better than you can't you can't be better because verse 14 6 14 says sin doesn't have the you're not controlled all in nature. You may visit there, but it doesn't. Christ controls you, but that's where we go with, with verses 16, 16, and 17, because he says in, in, in the next verses, after he says, "What then shall we sin more with about more?" Certainly not. And then he goes on to say, "The side that you feed the most is the side that's going to win," which makes perfect sense, doesn't it? So let's read verse 16. Do you know that to whom you present yourself slaves to obey, you are that one slaves whom you obey? Sin leading to death or of obedience leading to righteousness? So again, who's he speaking to? He's speaking to the church of Rome. Comprised of Jews, that Gentiles that became Christians. And maybe Jews and Gentiles that did not become Christians. Maybe just they're trying to figure it out, you know, which is a good thing to remember because everyone that comes to church is not out of their place with God. We be patient, and, but we need to be forthright and believe in what we're all about, too. The comments over there. <laughs> I, love, I love that. Thank you, buddy. That's good. Uh, <laughs> all right. Yeah, those comments, I'm not going to take time, but I all of you reach out. Um, I realize, you know, uh, this stream, it is a Bible study, but I, I it's also a time for us to fellowship with you, but you with me and you with each other. So I, I realize there's some talking. that That's great. I, I mean, you know, it's the best we could do under the circumstances. I mean, normally we take a 10-minute break, break for coffee, you know, but on Wednesday. But anyway. Okay, so... Okay, so, so 17. But God be thanked that, that though you were slaves of sin, so that, you know, Paul's saying, now he's addressing those that are slaves of sin, you know. You obeyed from the heart that form of God to which you were delivered, and you were set free from sin, and became slaves of righteousness. It's a twofold message here. One, one message is, you haven't done this yet. You need to do it. And number two, I'm just refreshing your memory. Paul says that you are no longer slaves to your old life and your old lifestyle and your old sinful habits. <laughs> you are now a slave to righteousness. But you feed the most is going to is going to win. You know, it makes perfect sense. The one you feed is going to win. 
And so we need to be feeding our spirit man with the good things of God. Okay. okay. Look, look at verse number um, uh, verse number 17 is really important. You obeyed from the heart the form of doctrine to which you were delivered or you were in, you were entrusted. In other words, you 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 heard the word, you received the word, it was delivered to you, it was in, and you obeyed that doctrine with your heart. Can I tell you something? It's always a matter of the heart. We'll mess up every time. Our, the way we the, the, cross, uh, the way we cross. Sometimes we think the wrong way. What we call stinking thinking is it, good, but but the heart, you know, many times is okay, even though it doesn't come out the right way. But let, let me just talk about heart for a minute. Um, Let's see, where am I? Jesus said in Luke 45, he said, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Um, hey, my phony, you're interesting to this? What are you having, Tony? Can I have a little bit of it on the side? Uh, so Jesus said, out of the abundance of speech. You ever want to know somebody's heart? You ever want to know what's in your own heart? Listen to what you're saying. Are you filled with negativity and criticism? Oh, it's like a poison in the name of Christ. People gossiping. Oh, it's like, it's like. But see, what Jesus said, what's in your heart comes out of your mouth. Saying you 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 don't you're not even you know most of the time, but whatever's out of your mouth, a question of what is heart. When, when Paul writes, you, you obeyed from the heart that doctrine you're entrusted with. You know it's all heart matter, always a heart matter. But I would ask you to evaluate your words, evaluate how do I sound. And so that's that's important. Uh, other scripture. Uh, I want to. I want you to go here with me. Proverbs chapter four. Way, way, well, not way back. Halfway through the Bible, from Solomon's. He, 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 God used Solomon justly, but Proverbs four twenty. He says, "Keep your heart with diligence, for out of your." Come the issues of life. Our spring the issues of life. Wow. Healthy in body, be super intelligent, or, or we may not be. You know, you may be physically, you know, not too well. But heart that matters. It's the heart that matters. So he says, keep your heart. Or or Protect your heart or guard your heart because out of your heart spring the issues of life. Okay, so back to what we were talking about. That temptation to steal the bicycle. No, no, no. You got to guard your heart against that. Your mind might say, but I need to. But your heart, your spirit man, this is referring to the spirit man, really, the heart. You know, you have to protect your heart from that, that reasoning. God will provide for you. For your transportation, he'll provide whether it's money, food, or whatever. God will provide, he'll use various means. Or so it's a matter of the heart. A temptation to become immoral. well, nobody will know. No, we'll know. You know, protect your you gotta guard your heart against this kind of stuff. Um, what's the other? Oh, you're having a problem with someone in the church. Uh, you know, you may act on the inside, oh, it doesn't bother me. On the inside, you want to strangle somebody. Come on. Have you ever been there? You know, but you got to put your heart from that. And, and as Jesus said, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So 
Solomon says, guard guard with all diligence. You know, don't just take a look. You've got to be diligent to guard your heart. All the typical things that we all know we should do. Read the word of God. Have your have your prayer time. Have your worship time. Don't just play Christian music that you have playing. Think about it. Meditate on it. Let it minister to your spirit. Um, and die to yourself. You know, diligently, you know, stay on it. You know, stay on it. Out of it, spring the issues of life. So this is what he says. Get a load of this. Put away from you a deceitful mouth. Don't lie. Don't lie. It'll 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 mess up your heart if you lie. And put perverse lips far from you. Per perversity, conflict, issues that cause stir up trouble. Put them far from you. If you don't, your heart will be affected. You look straight ahead. Don't be comparing. Yourself. Don't be judging everybody. And you're better than everybody or whatever. You look straight ahead. And your eyelids look right before you. It just is there. Uh, ponder the path of your feet. Yeah. Ponder the path of your feet. How's your walk with the Lord doing? Before you can say how somebody else is doing, how are you doing? I mean, these are things that I personally do. <laughs> I do this all the time. Let all your ways be established in the Lord. Do not turn to the or to the left. And remove your foot. So keep your heart, heart diligence. You know. So going back to Romans the six uh, seven Romans six seventeen. Um, you made from the heart that form of doctrine to which you were delivered, and you were saved from sin. You became slaves of righteousness. Hallelujah. Let me continue. Nine nineteen. I skin human. Don't you love when Paul speaks? You know, in preparation. I forgot to. I forgot to read. I was going to read earlier, but Psalm one thirty nine. We won't look at it now, but I think it's Psalm fourteen. I'm a verse fourteen or fifteen. One thirty nine, fifteen. I think it is. I am. Uh, I will praise you. For I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your words, O oh God, and that my heart knows very well. I thought about the way he's addressing this. People would say it's a little bit complicated because he, he repeats, he reemphasizes, he looks at it in a different way, all to make the same point. But then again, Psalm 139, if you read the whole Psalm, God made us. He he our thinking. He knows how we process it. And so when we read the word of God, it could be a little confused. God knows how we feel about this. And, 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 but it's custom made to fit the creation that he made. Us. So, so yeah, I'm wonderfully made complicated. I am complicated. You are complicated, not just physically. I mean emotionally, spiritually, mentally. We are complicated people, but God knows us so well. But the word that He has given to us fits the nation that He made. So He says, I'm, I'm speaking to you in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh. Oh, yeah. Right. Just as you were present, just as you presented your members as slaves of uncleanness, lawlessness, leading lawlessness. How many of you can remember that those days? One thing led to another, going from bad to worse. So now present your members righteousness and holiness. This is this is the whole thing. The battle's on. The, uh, Jesus won the battle. We're in the war. I guess you could say he we won the battle of the war still. We're still fighting skirmishes. We got the big kick in the battle. We win at the end. But right now, we go through battles. There's spiritual battles, there's flesh battles, there are battles within ourselves, battles with people, unfortunately. But as we present our, our members, our bodies, our beings, as uh, slaves to righteousness, we, we, we experience the victory 
and the uh, the the lifestyle of a, a various Christian person on earth. And that's what I want to do. I want to I want I want to look back on my life. Uh, I've been victorious uh, through most of my troubles and tribulations. I don't want to leave a legacy as one a Christian that was always down, always defeated, always grumbling, always messed up, but by God Jesus. I don't know. I to heaven, I so, but what I'm saying is there's so much us now uh, with, with what God sent to us. Uh, <laughs> all right. I'm looking at some comments. I don't want to. Okay, so Romans six. Let me finish up this little section here. Oh, six twenty one and twenty two. Great verses. What fruit did you have in the things of which you are ashamed? In other words, in your your former life, or hopefully it's not your present life, but in your life before you were fully surrendered to the Lord. Oh. I, I, I visit my mind uh, sometimes still with sentence in my heart, even though I know I've been re I've been forgiven. And I, but I know some fruit in my life that that's good, either hurting people, myself, uh, being embarrassed or embarrassing other people, making bad decisions and, and all that. that. That's the bad fruit, you know. Uh, the end of those things is verse 21. But now, but now, having been set free from sin, hallelujah, and having become slaves of God, hallelujah, whose slave are you? Are you a slave to the flesh or to God? I'm a slave to God. You have your fruit, holiness, two things, to holiness and in the end to everlasting life. So my fruit now is holiness. Oh, that's something I got to take care of because my sinful nature doesn't gravitate towards holiness. Our nature gravitates unholiness and uh, pride and arrogance and sufficiency. But see, my redeemed self gravitates holiness. I want. You know, First Peter one says, "Be holy." The Lord says, "I am holy; therefore, you be holy." We're holy. We're called to be separate, way of the ways of the world, the lifestyle of the world. Um. So, so, so the fruit now, fruit to holiness, it's not just living a moral life. Well, it is living a moral life, but it's all the the good fruits out of living a moral life. Well, people, people elect you. You'll be a man of your word. You'll have a solid family. Uh, you'll be looked up to on your job. Uh, as a person's word. Uh, all these things fall under the, the category of be, being holy, being a, a holy person, being a, a person right with God. And then really we have everlasting life. So this is the fruit, the fruit that we have in our lives. It's a life of holiness and good. And, and we leave that. That's what in us and that's that's what we need to find. Jesus said in Matthew 5 he's a light for men you'll see your good works and glorify my father who is it. so yeah do good things with a good heart that's the fruit we leave behind we're not leaving behind bad anymore we're leaving behind good fruit okay so verse 20 to wrap it up a little time Paul gives a great free statement of, of this section. He says, the wages of sin is death. We should know that by now. And, and we all deserve death, right? We all deserve the, the penalty for our sin. But the free gift of God, eternal life in Christ Jesus, Lord. So Romans 3, 3 and Romans 6, 23 kind of go together. Romans 23 says, all have sinned. And fall short of the glory of God. Three, three. Six, six, the wages of sin. All have sin. The wages of sin. 
you know, is death. So what are we going to do? So again, chapter, uh, verse number 24, Oh, wretched man that I am, who will deliver? All have sinned. I have sinned. The wages of Jesus. What am I going to do? Ah, thanks be to God. Through Jesus Christ, I have come. And so, uh, so he, he he ends this section with that phrase, just to just to reemphasize the whole that under the law, under the Adam, under Adam, under the fallen nature, there's sin and law and death and unrighteousness, and under the law of Christ, there's grace and mercy and forgiveness and um, <laughs> an everlasting life, new life in. And then, okay, just uh, chapter 7, he goes, Or don't you know, brethren, for I speak to those who, are, who know the law. Now he's going to get back into speaking to the Jewish people. See, this is, a, this is a whole major dialogue that Paul's having with this church. He's pouring out. <laughs> he's hitting them with everything he has, I think. Trying to the point of understanding. The law is not going to do it. You you're, can't do it. Uh, you know, you're, you're educated. Or you have nothing that's going to do it, only your relationship with Jesus Christ. Going back to the theme of the for in this gospel, in this gospel is the righteousness of God. So I'm so glad that as we like somebody told somebody, and somebody told somebody, somebody finally told me, and somebody finally told you, you and uh, we we understand that, that yeah, God loves us. And we repented of our sins to the Lord. And even now, after many, many years, my heart continually has to be renewed. That's what we battle. We're fighting the good fight of faith. Paul writes in another place, work out yourself with fear and trembling. You know, work it out. You know, you're not perfect yet. You're a perfect state. Work it out. Whatever your, whatever your, your shortcomings are, whatever you your failures are work it out expose those dark areas to the light of christ let them burn away that's not good and all that's not right and let the let the real you come out let the real me come out god made in the image of god you know that this is all about so hopefully it's helpful for you tonight next week lord willing we'll get into chapter seven continue on uh i did see a lot of comments here and I, I, you know, I didn't have time to really, uh, but I'll look at them later tonight. I'll write back and I'll try to send you a little note. Um, okay, so uh, we are back uh, on Tuesday and Thursday. We're on from twelve to twelve thirty. Um, have a name for it, and I forget the name. Tuesday, Tuesday and Thursdays. Henry will be live streaming uh, just for a half an hour, have a little devotional, and, and we'll be with you again on Sunday at 1045 in the um, If you have anything you need to know, please uh, write me, call me, text me, yell at me <laughs> by the church. Uh, uh, somehow, uh, we'd be happy to uh, talk with you. Let me pray. Okay. Dear Lord, thank you for tonight and your word uh let your word really be food for our soul and our spirit and uh may we be better for it that we would all ask, uh to leave the old man and, and to trust you for new things new attitudes new insights into your word uh lord we do pray to be creative and do what we're doing through this coronavirus situation well, we give it all to you, Lord. I pray your blessing over New Life Christian Assembly, over other visiting tonight. Again, Lord, for those families that have been hurting through this whole pandemic, to be comforted by your presence. Those that have lost loved ones, Lord, comfort them. And Lord, those that may, be, may be tired of the whole situation, Lord, Lord, bring hope to us, bring life to us, bring a, a creative nature to us to to develop new ways to look at it. So thank you for this. Thank you for your word. 
Uh, we pray your blessing upon each one now as we go. Hallelujah. In Jesus' name we pray. And he said, amen. Lord willing, we'll see you tomorrow at 12, okay? God bless.